If only there was a police body camera and the covert curfew continues, sort of. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Julie Carr Smythe, State House correspondent for the Associated Press, Joe Moss of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition, and Bob Clegg, Republican strategist. At week's end, Columbus was bracing for another round of racial justice protests after the fatal shooting of a black Columbus man by a white Franklin County Sheriff's deputy. Last week, Deputy Jason Meade shot and killed 23-year-old Casey Goodson. Goodson's family says he was shot in the back as he tried to get into his home holding a sandwich. He was just a black man coming home from a dentist appointment. He didn't do anything. And he was killed and murdered, cold bloody, cold bloodedly in a violent manner. For that day. In a statement released by Deputy Meade's attorney, Meade claims Goodson had a gun and pointed it at him. And the deputy says he ordered Goodson, Goodson to drop the gun. What led to the confrontation is unclear. The deputy had just given up the search for another suspect when deputies say Goodson waved a gun at them. Goodson had a legal permit to carry a concealed weapon. The case has raised enough questions that the Federal Justice Department will investigate alongside the Columbus police. Joe Mas, this is a tragic case no matter what, and it really could have been solved, possibly, had the sheriff's deputy been wearing an operating body camera. We would have known what happened. That's right. And, and this is what we're seeing in so many cases, right? at least we used to see in so many cases, because now there is somewhat widespread use of body cams. And the, the ironic thing about the whole thing is that uh, our, our sheriff has absolutely no problem with equipping their deputies with the body cams. They just, according to him, had not gotten around to it and expected to do it this year in 2021. And we have to view these things superimposed on a long history. And by that, I mean history with a capital H of law enforcement issuing self-serving comments when something inappropriate happens. So that's the reason that, that society is suspicious of those same comments. Um, Julie Carr Smythe, transparency has just not been very high in this case. Police want to protect their investigation, they, and they always try to be very careful with the details they release. But it took a couple of days just to get the names of the folks involved. Um, we got really no details from the aut preliminary autopsy report. It just it, it increases suspicion when there's very few details out there. Right. It felt it felt as if it was um, extremely just uh, slow at coming forward. And I don't know if there was was worry, but that's kind of what came across was that you know, well, we were being very hesitant to uh, to say what's happening. And uh, like you say, w if there were briefings on these things of exactly what we know and when we know them, uh, then uh, that would be helpful to the public and to the journalists. But uh, one of the things is you want to protect, uh, or that I should say the FOP wants to protect that officer uh, in the early moments of that while the family is is reeling from the result. Bob Clegg, there was some there was an awkward moment at the beginning of this investigation. The, the city started to investigate it, the city of Columbus did, and then they a couple of days later said we're handing it off to the Attorney General's office, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, BCI. And then a couple hours later the Attorney General said, No, no, we we don't want it. We didn't call us in time. What do you think was going on there? Well, the attorney general um, stated that, you know, they don't get involved in these unless they're brought in immediately, which they obviously were not brought in immediately. Uh, they they want to be there at the scene of the crime, uh, you know, to get all the evidence and all of that. Um, they weren't. So that's why he says he backed out. Um, I find it amazing that the sheriff and our three county commissioners in Franklin County John O'Grady, Kevin Boyce, and Marilyn Brown have not had the ability to fund these body cams that that these deputies should have. They fought for uh, the commissioners fought most of this year to get hundreds of thousands of dollars for 
uh, advertising for early voting, but somehow they couldn't find the money to do these body cameras. Um, I just think uh, the county here has some really screwed up priorities. Uh, I don't. And my, go ahead, Julie. And Mike, as as you say, I mean, during these times when this issue has become such a hot button and people are wanting accountability from the police, it's just um, e it's even more striking that that those were not available. Joe, Moss, what is it? Mike, go ahead. What is? Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, can I can I make two two counterbalancing observations? First of all, I find it difficult to believe that Mr. Goodson was was driving down the street waving a gun when there is law enforcement, which presumably they were probably wearing the body armor and so on. But then at the same time, I always find it I also find it very difficult to believe that the uh, statement uh, through his attorney Mark Collins of the officer that uh, he uh, shot uh, Mr. Goodson because he was pointing a gun at him, uh, that that would, uh, that he would make that statement if the entry wounds would be in the back, as the grandmother suggested. So I, I think we have a couple of things here that are, are difficult to, to swallow, and we're going to have to wait for the autopsy. I mean, the preliminary autopsy would have shown the entry wounds. So why not release that? And you could say, well, look, it doesn't mean anything because he could have pointed the gun and immediately turned around. I mean, there is a there is an explanation, even if he was shot in the back. But why not at least say that? Why not just say in the torso? I mean, that's just it's it begs questions. It does. It does. Uh, what does it say to you, Joe, that the Justice Department entered the case so quickly? I'm sorry, Mike, were you asking me? Yes, what does it mean that the FBI is investigating so quickly? Well, don't forget that there were federal officers in, uh, present at the time as well. But uh, the, the the other reason is that I think it, it, it begs for their involvement, particularly, as Bob mentioned, after uh, CPD decided uh, somewhat late to not investigate and then uh, left the, the investigation hanging uh, the, 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 since the Bureau of Criminal Investigation then was not going to take the case. So the only thing left is for them to do it. So, uh, you know, I certainly uh, applaud that. You know, lots, of, lots and lots of questions uh, in this case. The, the mom of the, of the man uh, has asked for peace this weekend as, as protesters gather at the state house, and we hope that uh, continues. As COVID cases continue to rise, Governor DeWine continues to plead with Ohioans to do the right thing. Stay home, wash your hands, wear a mask. Three weeks ago, the governor issued his 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew and hoped the numbers would get better. Well, here's how we've done. Three weeks ago, Ohio was seeing an average of 5,200 cases per day, new cases. Now we're at nearly 10,000. We were seeing 210 new hospitalizations a day. Now we're seeing 361. Three weeks ago, Ohio was seeing 25 deaths a day. Now we're seeing 67. But rather than impose new restrictions, DeWine is giving the curfew another three weeks. We're trying to get a balance. And the balance is, you know, to allow people to do some things, to allow businesses to stay open to some point, but also to, to pick up something and have less contact. And so you, so you make those decisions. Julie Carr Smythe, Mike DeWine keeps saying he's watching the numbers. He says we're in a crisis. He says there's a tsunami approaching the hospitals. Despite all the, the rhetoric, he basically keeps using the same plan, just asking people to do the right thing. Right. And he's uh, I, I don't know how many times I've said that Mike DeWine is in a hard situation because he is trying to balance the economy and uh, the virus. But at the same time, we think back to the original beginning of all this. And remember, you know, you couldn't go get a haircut. You, you the library was closed. The uh, uh, almost everything where you wanted to go was closed. There was a stay at home order. And, you know, these were uh, really praised around the country as ways in which uh, Ohio was uh, making strides that were better than a lot of other states. And I think that there's a huge backlash here, uh, particularly among uh, uh, conservative Republicans in, in DeWine's party that he's trying to balance who, you know, are fighting to keep the economy open. And so, you know, it's, it is a hard uh, balancing act, but um, the threats are, to, and the request to please do the right thing don't seem to be paying off. 
Bob Clegg, the governor, said that even though those numbers we just showed have, have increased over the past three weeks, he says the pace of the increase is slowing, but there's still like double and triple the, the numbers we saw three weeks ago, and if that's the gauge, I mean, what do we hope to gain in the next three weeks as people gather for Christmas celebrations and things like that? And, and that's the problem we have here. I mean, uh, we're, I think what, what they're saying now is most of the spread that's going on is occurring now within residences, within families, within homes, um, not so much with business. So how do you regulate inside someone's home? Uh, you just can't. I think where the state needs to focus is on uh, nursing homes, uh, you know, assisted living facilities. I think if there's any kind of um, uh, things that should be done or instituted by the state, it should be in those kinds of areas because that's where this this virus is most deadly. That's where uh, a lot of the deaths, if not more than half the deaths are occurring. And I think their focus should be in that area versus uh, other areas. Joe Moss, I got stuck in traffic today and yeah. we were not getting stuck, as Julie mentioned, we were not getting stuck in traffic back in March. And the, and the spread in the cases are far more serious than they were back in the spring. What do you think the governor should do? Is he doing enough? Well, no, I don't think that he's doing enough. I would like to see somewhat of a return to where we were earlier in the spring, uh, when I, I think we were seeing some results uh, as a consequence of the more stringent guidelines. But you know, I was hoping that after the presidential elections, the symbolism associated with wearing the mask and being in crowds and doing things that are quite frankly insane uh, would, would go away. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be the case. It doesn't seem to be the case inside uh, the General Assembly. And, uh, and, and by the way, as Bob mentioned, you know, about the, 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 the infections coming, happening within families. Yeah, but that's coming in from the outside, from contact that people are having, inappropriate contact out in the community. Uh, I think that we need to depoliticize this issue. It's a public health issue. Wear your mask. Stay apart from people. Uh, do things like this, Zoom meetings, and, and be careful. Bob Clay, getting back to the curfew, it's 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. You're not supposed to go shopping. Bars have to close. But the governor carved out an exemption for this weekend. You can still go to the University of Cincinnati football game, the crew MLS championship. The Browns play Monday night. Those games will last past 10 o'clock. And he said, yeah, those guys are OK. Does that does that make any sense to you? Or should he just said, you know, no, no spectators at those games, curfew violators? <laughs> Well, Mike, that is part of the balancing act that we've been talking about. Yeah. Uh, you're trying to balance uh, this this disease, this virus, with living your life. And uh, the governor's trying to balance it as best he can. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to criticize him for uh, making some exemptions for those things because, um, you know, it, it's part of, unless, and Joe's right, we, we did a great job in the spring with everything shut down. Uh, we wouldn't have this if you would have kept everything shut down uh, from, from March till now. Uh, this is part of doing a great job in the spring. What, what happened was we, we extended it out so that now it's, it's, it's coming out like crazy now versus, you know, April and May. Um, but, but, you know, people are going to want to live their lives. I mean, that's what it's about here. And, and Mike, if I, if I can add, also the what the governor was addressing uh, is a curfew. And the only reason that curfews are important, in my view, is, for example, with respect to restaurants, for the simple reason that people drink, and when they drink, their judgment uh, goes out the window. But yeah. at the sporting events, if all that you're doing is extending the time, but all other guidelines stay in uh, social distancing and masking and so on, that probably would be okay. In that case, I think Bob and I are in agreement. Just a guess here. I don't think Joe Moss has been to a Browns game lately because because <laughs> 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 there's plenty of indulging going on at Browns games. But gets to my point, if you're a bar owner, now it's, it's pretty warm the end of this week, and you have, you're, 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 you're abiding by the rules. You have outdoor seating you know, with the heat, with the portable heaters. You have people spread apart. 
you got to send everybody home at 10 o'clock. But the guy at the Browns game can go up and get a large beer and after 10 o'clock. It's not really fair to that bar owner, right, Bob? Well. Or Julie? Go ahead. Julie, go ahead. Some of the, yeah, some of the exemptions do seem somewhat random. Uh, I know the governor mentioned this week things like it's fine to have a uh, campfire in your backyard if you're masked and whatever. And he's really, I've not heard him say that before, but at the same time, he's saying don't have social gatherings. Uh, he told, he had the doctors who we called, uh, you know, the 12 angels of death <laughs> say that you shouldn't have, um, you know, you shouldn't have any gatherings or weddings or funerals and that kind of thing. So uh, it just, it, continues even all these months later to feel rather random yeah. uh, what we're being told. Yeah, it appears COVID is affecting the state legislature's lame duck session. House and Senate leaders canceled sessions this week as at least four lawmakers tested positive for COVID. Many other lawmakers and staff are isolating because they came in contact with them. The Ohio Capital Journal traces the positive cases back to a House Finance Committee meeting last week. GOP leaders say the scheduling conflicts and not COVID are forcing the cons cancellations. Whatever the reason, lawmakers now are really scrambling to finish work on the nuclear bailout, the capital budget, and maybe an override of Governor DeWine's veto of his bill to curb his ability to issue health orders, which is kind of ironic. Bob Clegg, you spent a lot of time at the State House. Um, yeah. Are you? Would you feel comfortable going down there right now? Sure. Okay. I, I would feel comfortable. Um, you know, it, it, and I understand if you, if someone doesn't feel comfortable going down there, don't go down there. Um, I mean, you can follow committee hearings now virtually. Uh, you can follow session virtually. Um, so, I mean, there's no great uh, reason to be there um, unless you're going to be voting on something. And then even then, I think if a member feels they're threatened by being there, they shouldn't be there. They have their own free will and um, they should, ex you know, just do what they think is best for, for themselves. But they, of course, would lose their right to vote because they haven't allowed for virtual voting. But you don't think they should shut down the legislature like other states have done? No, I mean, I, you know, it, it de just depends on how much they want to try to get it um, done in this lame duck session. Um, I, I don't know what the priorities are. I'm sure some of this stuff could wait until next session. Uh, it's not going to be changing all that much other than Republicans have more seats both in the House and the Senate. So it's not going to matter one way or the other. So it's just a, um, an issue of the priorities of the legislature at this time and how many of these issues cannot be held over to a new session. And, and that's for them to determine. They could determine that everything they just punt and everything just goes into next session to start over again. Julie Carsmith, you've covered many a lame duck session. Uh, how are, how uh, if they don't cancel the sessions because of COVID, they're not gonna they're gonna want to try to get as much done as they can. That's the way these sessions always work. Absolutely, and I mean the thing is that lawmaking is an extremely human interactional um, activity. You know, there are lobbyists who are going to want to try to make their case. There are journalists who are going to need to go in there and um, potentially risk their health to try to get fresh comments from people who are not giving i mean i will say that a couple of the legislative leaders have tried to do what we call gaggles with the with the reporters um virtually so that they're able to um you know they're they're able to get some comments uh the way the governor does with the reporters, but it's difficult because the whole process is a, is a human endeavor that, you know, they could cancel it or they could make the rules the same for everybody and not have people just wonder whether to risk their health or not. Joe Mosley, of course, there's still a lot of lawmakers or a fair number of lawmakers, I don't know, not, not a majority certainly, but are not wearing masks still and there's been no movement to mandate masks. Democrats tried in the last week or so to get that through and that still doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 the problem is that this remains to be, a, you know, a great opportunity for symbolism rather than looking at it as just a practical thing that you can do to protect yourself and protect your family and staff members who may or may not share your view. Uh, it's, it's important uh, why we have to politicize that. Uh, well, I guess I know why, but uh, we're beyond that right now. And I think the time has come to be practical. Just wear the darn thing. Uh, social distance and get on with it. 
One of the things before lawmakers is that so-called repeal and replace of House Bill 6. And as lawmakers try to figure out what to do with the scandal-plagued law that bailed out the two nuclear power plants, the, just how the state regulates Ohio's electric companies and other utilities has drawn closer scrutiny. The state is looking for a new head of the Public Utilities Commission after its chairman resigned following an FBI raid on his home. Sam Rendazzo had close ties to First Energy, which is at the heart of the bribery scandal, and he had close ties to manufacturing, which uses a lot of electricity. This week, the Associated Press reported that before he appointed Rendazzo, Governor DeWine was warned that Rendazzo had undisclosed financial ties to First Energy. Julie Carr Smythe, you wrote the story this week, and you've been all over this story. What is the governor, what does he have to say about those warnings that uh, others say he received? Well, what he told us was that, uh, yes, you know, people did speak to him about this, but that he, there wasn't much new in his view to what already was known about Sam Rendazzo, who had been out, uh, who had been around for 40 years and has been around 40 years in utility law in Ohio. Um, what our reporting found was that a memo was prepared, kind of a dossier, um, talking about sort of opaque uh, ties that really even now are very difficult for us to, to trace uh, in terms of uh, businesses that Sam Rendazzo had that have been listed in the First Energy uh, Solutions bankruptcy. And um, then, of course, the consulting contract was not something that the governor was told about. Um, but he still defends the choice and says that um, he uh, that Sam Rendazzo was an expert and that he was well vetted. Bob Clegg, this is a this is this is complicated stuff. Regulating utilities, it's laws of physics, it's electricity science, it's very complicated economics, and to have someone to regulate that to oversee it, they have to almost be an expert. They really do have to be an expert in the field. So how do you find somebody who's not from the industry? to regulate it because that's where the experts are. I mean, that's that's the that's the catch 22 that governors f face every time they try to fill one of these positions, right? Right. And and that's the the problem that Governor Dwine has here because he wants individuals that, that are aware of, of the big there's a lot of major issues involved with public utilities, uh, affordability, um, all kinds of things. So, I mean, you got to find those kinds of experts but every expert that you would find would have some connection, some way, somehow to utilities, because that's how they develop their expertise. So I don't know what the answer is here. Maybe we start putting people that really have no uh, public utility uh, uh, knowledge on, on the PUCO, uh, but I don't think that would work out well. I think it's, you know, I think well, what we have to do is just a better job of vetting. And, but I'll tell you, if, if you have an individual who is not coming fully forth with all the uh, information, it's kind of hard to, to find it all until later. Yeah. And, and unfortunately now it's it's a little too late. Joe Moss, what, what is the solution? I mean, there's a revol there are revolving door laws where you can't go from industry to a government role right away. You've got to sit out a year or two. We're seeing that with the defense secretary. You're supposed to be out of the military for seven years before you can serve as defense secretary. Is that a solution? You have to be totally separate from the industry for a certain period of time before you well, can serve I in this role? Clear. I think the solution is clear. I think that, that Mike the one ought to appoint me. Uh, <laughs> I, but I, um, I think there is a stipend or a salary associated with this. And, and, uh, and Bob is right. I mean, I know nothing about the industry. So I guess probably I would bring all the good people in, I, I, you know, all the, I think they call the lobbyists to yeah. suggest what I should do. Uh, but uh, yeah, kidding aside, I, I, I think maybe the expertise in the, in the industry narrowly is not as important, but maybe a marauder interested, some, somebody that has served the boards and commissions before at that level. Yeah, transparency well, is always good. We got to get to our final off the record parting shots. And Joe Moss, we will start with you. Thank you, Mike. The Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court has stated that she does not think that the court has the authority to mandate COVID-related guidelines. Although suggestions have been posted, each judge is free to enforce whatever standards they wish. As the COVID rate of infection show an increase of over 35%, it appears critical to this older attorney 
that increase in the across the board use of telephone pretrials and absentia pleas and even online pleas and sentencing is absolutely essential. Several colleagues of mine have suffered infections and at least two have passed away during this period. Wow. Bob Tug, your final thought. Um, Mike, the Big Ten Conference gave us a perfect example this week in their changing eligibility requirements for the championship game that a rule is a rule until it isn't. <laughs> yes, we all have to be flexible during this pandemic. Julie Carr Smythe. Well, uh, my uh, forward looking thing is that I'll be covering the Electoral College on Monday when Ohio will uh, deliver its, its votes to Donald Trump. Uh, every state in the union is supposed to meet uh, on Monday. And so perhaps that will be the last day uh, that we don't know who, uh, how much fighting will go on for the presidential election. All right. I, along those same lines, my closing thought this week, two candidates showed us how it's done. State Senator Stephanie Kunze won re-election by about 100 votes. That's it. Over her Democratic opponent, Crystal Lett, when a recount this week confirmed that margin, Crystal Lett was shopping at Target with her kids, but used her cell phone to call Kunze to concede and congratulate her. In a press release, Kunze thanked Lett, congratulated her on her race, and promised to work with her on issues Lett cares about. That's how you do it. That's Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online, Facebook, Twitter, and our website, wosu.org slash COTR. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.